Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to The Lookout. Today is the 21st of August, and this is going to be a briefing on fires in Northwestern. We've got some new intel this morning from infrared flights last night. Uh, ever since this fire complex started about a week ago, it's been difficult to get infrared. Uh, there's been technical problems with the national infrared plane, and then there's uh, you know often weather problems. The infrared can't really see that well through clouds. And as we know, there's been a lot of clouds and thunderstorms. So uh, the folks up there in the plane kind of have to dodge the clouds. And they've got a box drawn on the ground of uh, what the people on the ground want to see mapped. And uh, so it's it's kind of tough to pull it all off. And so um, last night we got about half of the fires covered. And so we'll share some of that new infrared. I think the main thing that we want to cover on these fires in Northwestern California is just that there's not enough resources to fight these fires and really stop them. And this is often the case when we have large fires on the landscape, especially in this really broken, difficult to access country, is once the fires get large and established, we won't put them out till it rains. And definitely uh, focus gets put on ones that threaten communities and work will be done protecting communities, but it takes a huge amount of resources to kind of initiate and pull off a tactical plan. And so often we end up kind of steering these fires. We'll have an opportunity to backfire from a ridge or a road system, or, you know, something will come together and there'll be an opportunity to secure one flank of the fire or something like that. But for the most part, these fires pretty much tend to do what they want until they hit another recent burn or it rains. So um, a lot of people are out there working hard to do what they can with the resources they have, but we'll talk about what it takes to really contain fires of this size in this terrain. And looking at the situation report for yesterday, the the horsepower is just not there. There's other fires burning. Um, and the Forest Service also has had a hard time staffing their equipment. They've had a hard time hiring people. They've had a hard time retaining people because um, Congress moves really slowly and the office of personnel management moves slowly and it's taking years for them to try to figure out how to pay federal wildland firefighters better. But in the meantime, uh, that's part of what's going on is that forest service in general has had a really hard time keeping positions filled. And then this is what happens is you have a big fire season, you have lots of new starts and there's just not enough resources. So um, we're going to kind of just jump right into the maps. And we're going to do a quick tour, um, and then we'll do an extended tour. But the quick tour is that the deep fire, we don't have a lot of new information on it. This is burning near, near Trinity Lake. It hasn't, as far as last mapping we had, has not crossed. Um, the Stewart Fork hasn't spread a lot um, in the last 24 hours, as far as we can tell. Red is mapping from yesterday and white is mapping from the day before the head fire head fire crossed the klamath river yesterday um and it's burning into the gap fire we'll talk more about that um and also yesterday or the day before it kind of blew over this ridge and it's backing down towards mill creek and there was a spot yesterday that was cut away quite a ways out and that's burning um, on the north side of the Klamath River as well. Coming down to Happy Camp, the U Fish and Malone fires. Um, we expect these to keep growing. We don't have any good intel on Malone, but just that you look at the train here and um, what it would take to, to box these in and put them out, and that's not happening. Um, so we'll, as I said, we're get we'll, we're starting to get more tactical information coming in from these fires. We'll have a better idea of what the box will be on this fire, but for now, it's kind of your classic ridgetop lightning fire that is backing down the hill. Um, canyon fire and Elliott fire continue to spread. There's potential for the Canyon fire to get deeper in the Dillon Creek and burn all the way to the ridge. Um, there's no real, um, control strategy in place to keep that from happening and likely won't be. Um, the perch fire above Orleans is burning in the footprint of the 2006 Soames fire. Here's Orleans. Uh, we don't have 
anything better than what we got yesterday for the perch fire. But the perch fire is well established on top of um, Somes Mountain here. Th this fire is definitely going to burn the 2006 fo Somes footprint. And um, it, it may get picked up here um, where, the, where the Butler fire was held up. But also going to be a large fire. Um, at least this big is what I'm hearing. The fire's mosquito fire and the blue fire um, aren't spreading fast. Uh, it's been a week and this fire is a thousand acres. So that tells you something about um, the intensity with which it's been burning. These fires also, um, they're trying to kind of box them in with existing roads. But as you can see, that's that leaves a lot of places where they're not probably going to box them in. The fire in Hoopa, Lone Pine Fire, we hear is fairly well wrapped at this point. Not much new spread, a little new spread last night was showing down here, or it still had some heat down here to the river, but nothing over the river and no um, major spread outside the box that they had yesterday. The fire over here in Oric, um, when you see a little finger like this on a fire, that usually tells you that's a firing operation. So you can see there's a road here and that they're carrying fire out this road. And so, um, and also you can see that the fire is kind of carried out on this trail. So this is kind of an example of what we talk about with, you know, um, in heavy timber where you can't necessarily get the resources to go direct, you know, likely there'll be some sort of firing operation that ties out here. into the roads and bridges and whatever else. This is inside of a national park. Heading up through the Six Rivers up to uh, 199 corridor. Um, the Kelly Fire and Holiday Fire have burned together. White is where they were yesterday. Um, red is where they are now. And then the, the kind of bright red and yellow are infrared mapping from overnight. So, um, Sorry about that. Infrared mapping from overnight, so you can see kind of continued steady growth. This mapping is from last night, so you know we know it's been windy overnight. We don't really know what's happened there in the last 12 hours. Uh, one thing that you'll probably see a lot of is the Wild Frontier camera, and that is um, showing overnight really active fire spread. So the Wild Frontier camera over the last six hours, starting about one in the morning, and showed really kind of extreme fire behavior out to the west of that. And so we'll show on the map here where you're looking. Um, this camera, this mountain burned over the night before last. And um, so you can see it's inside the perimeter of the fire and it's looking kind of to the southwest. So the fire that's spreading there actively is kind of spreading obliquely away from Gasky. But that just, just that blue line should give you an idea of what you're seeing in that scary footage. Okay, um, coming down here to the 3-9 and Pilot and Corral fire. Um, continued growth on these fires. Some firing operations happening along the road on the ridge here to um, try to box in the Pilot fire. Uh, it is held pretty much along the road. There's a little slop here um, over the road and you can never tell, like oftentimes firing operations, if there's a road um, pulls away from a ridge, they'll punch in line and fire off that. So we don't know if that's really a problem or not. Out here where it's spreading here, um, no new spread from the infrared versus um, what was mapped earlier. So don't know if that just means that the mapping that they're showing from earlier is from the infrared or not. But 3-9 um, fire we didn't get any infrared from that. Um, yesterday when they mapped it, there was scattered heat all over the place. Um, and it, that fire is active on the ball Jesse cam. So the 3-9 fire was active overnight on the ball Jesse webcam. It's hard to tell at night. Um, on infrared at night, everything looks a lot bigger than it is. And so, um, but as it gets light here, you can see that it's actively burning this morning with a fairly strong kind of um, south easterly flow. Some of these ridgetops are showing uh, 13 mile an hour winds. 
but down in the valleys it's you know two or three um humidities are fairly high you know 50 percent is a nice is a good humidity for you know we don't expect um, really extreme fire behavior at 50 percent humidity um, some places here we are seeing it a lot higher uh, this morning in chico it is sprinkling and temperatures are are low out there in general um not, I wouldn't say low, but they're not as high as they were, say, uh, four days ago. You know, ridge tops we're looking at 72, but in the bottoms here we're like 62. So it's fairly mild conditions this morning. No new intel on the slide fire over here in the Mendocino. So that wraps up the quick tour. And now we'll go a little more in depth. So we want to drill down a little here on the... Um, the Smith River complex, we know that that's the one that's really um, threatening probably the most people and showing a lot of aggressive fire behavior. Okay, so from Gasky, we're looking northeast up 199 towards Idlewild. We've got Kelly Fire that is now burned into the Holiday Fire. We've got the Diamond Fire and Corral Fire burning out here in the Biscuit Fire Scar. Much of the Holiday Fire had burned in the Biscuit Scar, but it's moved into other dense areas that haven't burned for a long time. And we've got the, um, this is the webcam direction. So we were watching extreme fire behavior last night on the webcam out in here, south of Gasky. Hurdy gurdy. And so, like I said earlier, we've got the white line shows where the fire was mapped yesterday, um, or the night before last. And then red is kind of the best mapping we had as far as yesterday. These fires got flowing last night. And so, um, and they got, the way they got flowing, they're all in different folders and it's kind of a, a lot of data to process. I don't have time to kind of clean them all up, but basically the yellow is areas that are scattered heat. Generally that's areas that we say are cooling down. And then these are intense heat. So we can see the holiday was spreading uh, maybe a half mile to the south west. Corral fire made a little bit of a push to the southwest. As we saw overnight, um, the Kelly fire did push pretty aggressively away from that camera hurdy-gurdy didn't have a lot of growth once you get a little farther out to the east here um, this is the Siskiyou wilderness and but in general there's just a not a lot of resources assigned to this fire if you look at the morning situation report from the national fire center from yesterday and i hadn't they hadn't updated this morning for 30,000 acres in the smith river complex we've got seven crews so that's 150 hand kind of hand crew firefighters 57 engines uh, for the whole Happy Camp complex, uh, we've got 47 crews, but we've got um, six major fires, right? So um, that's like um, eight crews per fire if you spread them out that way, but that's not how they do it. For the SRF Lightning complex, we've only got three crews, right? Then that's for, you know, a lot more than three fires. Right. So as we were saying earlier, that just means like there's not enough crews to come out. You know, like what we would do if we had every crew in the world right now. Um, we'd be out somewhere like this, prepping this ridge system with dozers and crews. And the strategy would be like, okay, it's going to take us. We think the fire is going to take five days to get here. And so it's going to take us five days to prep and fire it, right? So that's what it takes to contain a big fire like this is you need to have a strategy that's like, like uh, what the old timers say is you don't go to the next ridge. Um, you don't go out to the next ridge and fight the fire there. You go out to the next ridge where you have time to implement a strategy that's going to work. So that might mean that you would come out here and spend a week with chippers and crews and feather bunchers and bulldozers prepping this whole ridge system for a big firing operation that you would do it in advance of the fire arriving here. But there's not the resources to do that. So this fire is going to burn until it stops, until the weather changes or something, or we get the resources in place for a large strategy. But right now the crews aren't available and they're not, they're not building a big box. They don't have the resources to build a big box. So they'll be focusing on prepping communities, um, communication sites, other things where they ha can make a difference. But we, we can't expect that there's going to be any really meaningful landscape scale strategy that's going to keep this fire from doing what it wants to do. 
And that's the same for all these fires. You know, the SRF complex is um, these fires in here. We got three crews for that. Um, Happy Cab complex is a lot of smaller fires. But the same, we have the same situation going on here on the Elliott fire over in Cottage Grove. Is that if you had all the resources in the world um, a week ago, maybe you could have prepped this ridge system down here and tied it into the creek and and kept it from getting into this country where it's not fightable anymore. But now that it's established in here, there's nothing we're going to do really to keep this fire from burning up into here. When we talk about the big box, um, one way that you can kind of visualize where you have those kind of landscape scale opportunities is places that we've held previous fires. So if you look at any of these big fires we've had in the past and where they stopped, these fires stopped at the wilderness boundary. And that's because wilderness boundary means, um, well, in this case, it's a river. Sometimes fires stop at the wilderness boundary because you can't run dozers in the wilderness often. And then so you'll go right outside the wilderness and run a dozer line. But if you look at a big fire here, like, you know, we held this one at the roads here. This one got held at the river. This one got held on a ridge. So every single old fire, this one here, um, got held on this ridge system and then tied down another ridge down to the creek. And on the other side, it got held on the ridge. So every fire tells a story about a tactical campaign that was executed over, often over the course of weeks. Right, with thousands of firefighters. And so if we don't have those firefighters, that just doesn't happen, and we're, we're not going to stop these big fires. One thing we hear about that's interesting on this fire is just that um, the Six Rivers knows, the Six Rivers National Forest knows that they don't have the resources, and they also know that this big chunk here of unburned land, um, this is about 150,000 acres that hasn't had a big fire since the 1920s. And so in the meantime, as this fire is chunking along, um, the local fire staff know that they need to punch holes in this huge 150,000 acre chunk. If these two fires burn together and become a 30,000 acre piece that has burned, that helps fragment this whole landscape and make it less likely that the entire landscape is going to burn in one fire. Uh, so, the Six Rivers is more uh, comfortable talking about managing these fires for resource benefit. Right now, the Klamath, the language we're seeing out of the Klamath is still like, we're going to suppress every fire 100%, even though that's not possible, even though they don't have the resources to do that, and the fire doesn't care about policy. Uh, Six Rivers, it's refreshing, I think, to see that um, there's more acceptance of talking using that language and also of understanding that punching a big hole in this unburned landscape might not be the worst thing that could happen in the big picture. So that's um, that's about all we have time for this morning. Um, we'll continue on this. If you're working in operations on one of these fires and um, want to talk about a place that you are planning to implement, a, where you do have the resources to implement a control strategy, uh, we'd like to hear if you feel that we're misrepresenting what's going on. We'd like to hear. You can reach us through thelookout.org. And um, otherwise... Um, we thank you for all your support that keeps us all running. So um, good luck and have a good day.